Good evening, everyone. Today's topic is one of my absolute favorites in this class. It's on transportation. And transportation is an area that, that I've worked in for, for about six years come, before coming to Lamar. Um, with IBM, I installed uh, transportation management systems at some large companies um, that I'm sure all of you have heard of, UPS, and um, also worked with a FedEx project as well. And basically, these systems basically held all the transportation rates and helped the companies route their LTL freight through their network. Um, after that, I worked for a company that scheduled GM's logistics and, and did their planning and, and managed their tariffs and, and similar things. So today's lecture is actually one of my favorites. So let's, with, without any further explanation, let's go back and start the lecture. So before I start the lecture, I want to briefly put up some slides. Um, these are a little different than this year's homework. This is the truck question where you sum the inventory and then you multiply it by the cost per month to get an inventory cost. Um, this is the coffee bean question. We have 180 pounds of beans. Beans cost $2.40 a pound. Um, the coffee house estimates it's $45 to place an order. The holding cost is 20%. Well, the trick in this is to remember that you multiply the price by the interest rate to get the holding cost, which is um, 0.2 times 240. Find the, the, the Q star, which is the optimal order quantity, 229. What is the time between orders? Well, you take the Q and you divide by lambda. We order 229 each time. We, 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 we use 280 per year. So it's 0.8 years. And then you can compute the average annual holding and setup cost and uh, when to place reorders. One last example of the breadth of IE. And this slide's a few years old, but um, Walmart employs IEs along with a lot of other companies. And they want somebody at their distribution center and uh, to, to basically run their distribution center. Things like promote new technology, support operations through improvements and cost ideas, work on warehouse design, analyze new methods for work. Um, they want an IE degree, 30% travel, and ability to work on multiple projects. So a lot of opportunities in retail, pricing, inventory, warehousing, quality, and many jobs in logistics. Um, since I've been here, we've had one undergraduate who interned at a retail company, and no one's joined a retailer yet, because most of our undergraduates at least get jobs in manufacturing, which is fine, but, but keep in mind those opportunities. Now, in terms of domestic U.S. transportation, and most people already know this, in terms of dollars per pound, rail is going to be your cheapest. Obviously, um, barge is even cheaper than rail, but uh, you can't, you, barge is somewhat limited in this country. Um, and then your next cheapest option is typically intermodal, where you take the truck, you take it off the truck, you put the, the thing on a, tra a trailer, okay? So the chassis and the container separate, and then you put it on the trailer, and that's called intermodal freight, where you're doing truck, truck drives in, crane takes off truck, puts it on the train, and then another truck delivers it. Truckload, where you're renting the truck, essentially, to go from point A to point B is the third cheapest, okay? Usually price per pound. Multi-stop truckload, where you're, where you're picking up maybe three suppliers and taking it to your facility, but you're renting the truck, is the next cheapest. Because it's basically the same price as truckload, plus an extra $100 per stop or so. Now, after we get past truckload, things start getting more expensive. So if I only need to, to ship like a fifth of a truck, three or four pallets, I have to ship it LTL. In less than truckload, basically I call up the carrier, they take it to a local hub, they mix my freight with other people, and then they ship it to the destination, and then they split up the truck and send it out on, on local delivery trucks. Um, fairly expensive per pound. And then expedited ground, which is basically a fast version of LTL, think FedEx and UPS, is even more expensive. And then you have parcel, and then you have air, and then multiple types of air. So um, 
in terms of international freight, you basically have um, three, couple of options. One is ocean. Okay, you can move it by ocean, and that's usually pretty cheap, especially if you move it full container load, um, called FCL. Now, if I only need to move a box across the ocean, I'll move it what they call LCL, which is less than container load, which is the same as LTL. So the freight gets taken, consolidated. Now, now the question is, what happens to the price if I have to do a non-container move? Let's say I have a piece of equipment that won't fit in a container. Is that going to be a lot more expensive or a little more expensive or cheaper than just renting a container? Anybody? It's going to be significantly more expensive per pound. Okay? Because it's not the standard way things are moved, right? And that's non-container freight or freight bulk as they call it, okay? A lot of times, let's say I have to move a machine that won't fit in a container. If available, they may rent space on a car hole, hauler and shove the um, machine in, in, in there. Um, if it's not available, it, it gets extremely expensive. Now, air, if you're talking international, is shipped based on priority. You have priority one, which typically moves within maybe two days, priority two that moves within five days, expedite, which basically means you've paid to move it on the next plane, and then you have charter, where you rent the 747 and fly the parts, which happens more than you would expect. Now, in the United States, the, we have many different types of equipment. Not, not that many for truckload. Um, the most common is a 53-foot dry, okay? And that's shown there. It's what you see on the highway. And these are 53 feet long, 110 inches wide, and about 100, 102 wide and 110 high. And the weight is based on the restrictions of the roads, okay? Um, so the road may have a 60,000 pound weight restriction. Once you get rid of the truck and the, the cab and some safety factor, usually you're talking anywhere from 50 to 42,000 pounds is about what you can put on a truck. Obviously, it depends on what road you're in and what state you're in and a whole bunch of factors. But there are many equipment types. Um, one equipment type that, 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 is, that is used sometimes is what they call a drop deck, which is shown in the lower cor corner. And this is uh, about 100 inches high in the nose, but 130 inches high in the tail. And... Um, Depending on the dimension of the item that's shipped, it might be a good idea to use a drop deck. Um, rules exist typically for overhanging the nose. You've got to fit your pallets such that they don't overhang the nose. And um, drop decks, typically the, the, the carrier is going to charge you a premium for it. So let's say to rent the, the, the normal dry truck, it might be $2,000, but if you want them to bring a drop deck, it might be $2,100, Okay. And there are many equipment types in the U.S. and other countries, and you need to understand the dimensions of equipment and the availability and the relative prices. And you can always go out to your carriers and ask for bids when changing or improving equipment type. So one of the first considerations is, is equipment type. For ocean, there are basically three primary types of equipment. There's the 40D, the 40H, and the 20D. Um, and... The 40D is, uh, or the 20D is, the internal width is 7.9, the height is 7.10, and the length is about 20 feet, okay? And these, these will carry whatever the roads carry. Um, the payload on this is 62,000 pounds up to. Now, can you ship 62,000 pounds on an ocean container in the United States? No, because the truck won't be able to move, Right. So you're limited both by what the truck can carry and by what, what the ocean carrier could carry. Now, how are you going to be charged for transportation services? Okay. And the tariffs for transportation vary widely, but these are the common ones used in this country. For full truckload, you, you're either charged per mile based on a state-to-state -state matrix but if you're running the lane frequently, so the trucks, we're moving 10 trucks a week between Texas and New York, 
you'll call to the carrier and they'll give you a price for that move, okay? Less than truckload follows a tariff, and we'll talk more about tariffs. And so there's a preset rate that everybody pays, and then you get a discount off the tariff. Air is based on what they call dimensional weighting. So you're given a price per kilogram with a conversion factor for cubic meters. So typically, if I give them a cubic meter of stuff that only weighs 10 pounds, they'll still charge me for, for um, 1,000 pounds or whatever, 660 kilos, okay? Um, so they take the, the maximum of the weight based on the weight and the weight based on dimension, and then they, they give me that. Parcels, zone-based with published tariffs. Ocean is typically contract price per container, and less than ocean, ocean LCL is based on dimensional weight or cubic meters, typically. So an LTL tariff, you need to tell the, the software five things, essentially. You need to tell them a weight, a freight class, and different products have different shipping costs associated with them, right? So the motor carrier industry has designed, called this thing called freight class according to density, stowability, handling, and liability. And these characteristics have been, been converted into a freight class, which is a number from 50 to 500 that approximates the percentage charge compared to the standard tariff. Now, a freight class book is about that thick, okay? So if, if you have a part, let's say a steel auto part, you'll look it up, and there'll they'll be like six places in that book where it'll say steel auto part. And so if it's on a pallet and shrink-wrapped, it might be class 75. If it's in a box, it may be class 200, okay? So you got to define your, your product, um, look it up in the book, and then write down the freight class. Now, freight class is one of those tricky things um, because your carrier sees it, and they may go, ah, that was not properly shrink-wrapped. It's no longer a 75, but an 80. And then what do you have? You have a billing discrepancy, right? Because they think it was harder to move than, than you said. Um, another way to look at freight class. Um, steel is going to be a very low freight class, right? Because a pound of steel, easy to ship, right? Bubble wrap is going to be a high freight class. Why? 100 pounds of bubble wrap will fill up a whole truck. So it, it matters the density, stowability, how hard it is to handle, and the liability. And the industry's come up with this idea of freight class, gives us a number, plug it into the tariff. Next thing I have to tell the tariff is a discount. And typically, you negotiate a discount, and if you're using a czar tariff, tariff, discounts range, let's say, anywhere from 50 to 80 percent, which is kind of funny, because if everybody gets a 50 percent discount, isn't that the same as nobody? <laughs> um, which just cut all the rates in half. Yeah, why don't you? Yeah, but typically, discounts are high on, off czar. Um, there's a minimum charge, typically, and then. I type in the origin zip, the destination zip, and the tariff, and it spits out a price. Most LTL tariffs are what they call deficit rated. They're based on weight breaks, but you never really need to know all this detail because what you do is, is I went to a carrier's website and I entered um, Texas and Michigan. I told it that it was freight class 50. I needed to move 2,500 pounds, and so it came back with a charge. And I told it I had a 70% discount, and then I got a subtotal, and then it uh, appended a fuel surcharge of $100, and it tells me that it's going to cost $685 to move this item from Texas to Michigan, 2,500 pounds of steel. Does everybody get how this works? Plug in two, two zip codes, a freight class, a weight, and that's all you need to, to know about it, plus your discounts. You get a rate. And this is a very reasonable rate, but what do you notice? It costs, let's say, $2 a mile to send a truck from Texas to Michigan. It's 1,500 miles, so it costs you $3,000 to send a truck from Texas to Michigan. And just to send 2,500 pounds, they're going to charge me $685. So, LTL is very expensive per pound. 
is you know this the, I could put twenty of these in a in a full truck and send them for three thousand instead of the six hundred per. Now, carriers will charge you additional fees on LTL for many things. Liftgate is a common one. If I tell you to deliver to a place that doesn't have a dock, they're going to have to have a lift gate so they can get the freight out of the truck. Does that make sense for everybody? Hazmat, obviously. If you're talking truckload, two-person crew, right? Because, um, you know, you can rent a truck with one person. They can drive 16 hours per day. You can rent a truck. Well, one person can drive 10 hours or 11 hours, depending on what the current regulation is. I think it's 11. Two people can drive 16. So there's a time factor. Detention and demerge are huge factors. So if I keep your truck, you get billed for it, right? So if my dock's full and the truck's sitting there for three hours, they're going to make me pay some money. Um, late pickup, your um, packaging-related charges. I get them to move something, the pallet breaks. They're going to charge me for that broken pallet. Make sense to everyone? Fuel surcharge, not technically an accessorial, but that's uh, what you typically do with transportation is you negotiate a contract, and in the contract there's a mechanism for adjusting the cost based on the price of fuel. That way we don't have to keep changing the contract every time the price of fuel varies a couple of dollars. Um, so ocean carriers are based, containers are based on a tariff. And it's typically a private contract between the shipper and the carrier. And the rates are somewhat based on the number of containers with the item in the containers having very limited impact. Do you think an ocean carrier cares if I'm shipping auto parts versus cereal? It's in the container. They don't care. They don't even really care how much the container weighs as long as it meets road restrictions. Why? Because it takes up a spot on the ship. And the ship doesn't weigh out, it probably cubes out. So they don't really care as much what you're shipping as um, how many you're shipping. If I'm shipping 1,000 containers a year between two locations, I'll get a really good price. If I'm shipping two per year, I won't get quite as good a price, right? Because think about it. You're shipping 1,000 containers, three or four a day. They're going to be very excited to talk to you. If you're shipping one they're a lot less excited, right? And so rates are typically from origin to destination. And um, you can look at them in terms of six components. And this, this is not necessarily a good idea, but it's one way to think of it. And in some markets, this is how you would do it. You have two ports. Two inland moves, right? You have the ocean move. Okay? And then at the port, you have a terminal handling fee. Terminal handling charge, a THC. Okay? And just to give you some ideas on the economics. In this country, inland moves typically are on, on rail, plus the last part on truck. So this one might be, let's say, 600 to 1,000, maybe 2,000. Terminal handling fees in this country are, are pretty high, say 450. You might have anywhere from, four, let's say, 200 at the low end to 450, and that's kind of global, okay? And so 200 to 450. And then another 600 to 1,000 on this end. Now the question is, what does an ocean move cost? And this varies a lot. It varies by how many ocean, you know, the busyness of the, 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 the container fleets, right? Today they're, they're, they're not doing as well as they did many, you know, a couple of years ago to get from China to the U.S. it was about $6,000. Today it might be $5,000. Um, so... This would be, let's say, you, you know, AP to US, let's say 6,000, EU to US, 
and this is very approximate, maybe 3,500. Um, now US to AP, what's that going to cost? How many ocean containers go from China to the U.S.? Much. A lot more than... Could go back. Yeah. Probably get a discount just to get, keep, put something on that boat. Yeah, this is... Maybe $600 total. Okay. And then U.S. to EU would be about 2500 Okay? Couple of points. You can send an ocean container pretty much anywhere in the world within reason um, for about six or seven thousand dollars. Okay? So it's pretty cheap transportation. Um, and, you know, it varies where you're going greatly. It could be anywhere from six hundred dollars to six thousand dollars. Okay? So with that, we'll. We'll go to the second part of this lecture. So let me pause for a second.